the sustainable revolution for us at Lombardier is the biggest driver of future returns of portfolios. And since we are in uh, the business of trying to achieve returns on our portfolios, this is great news. It's great news, but it's also a responsibility, and a responsibility that, that has to be taken very, very professionally, as you all know in this room. There is the issue of, uh, about having a purpose, and mainstream investors hopefully will be driving the trends further with uh, purposes that they have in, uh, in uh, investing their savings. But there's also the issue of the fiduciary responsibility within, within which uh, this uh, concept has to be implemented, and that's where we stand. How do we make it happen? How do we transform the investment processes to make sure that instruments such as the green bonds, for instance, but not only, will be uh, the majority part of the portfolios of tomorrow? The continued, uh, of course, evolution and growth of the uh, fixed income market, and especially of this segment, of the green bond segment, is very important to all of us. It increases our ability, yes, to avoid carbon emissions and create positive impact, uh, not only on the environment, but also on societies. And uh, we need in these instruments as well to diversify the portfolio. So again, an additional uh, good and uh, positive effect of uh, the development of these instruments that are not that specific only, they are also very, very useful to simply diversify a asset class such as the fixed income asset class today in a very complex environment. Uh, at Lombardier, indeed, we believe that the world has uh, reached a tipping point. We think that uh, the world is changing and that we have to change with it. All those instruments are very, very important, but at the same time, as was mentioned before, you see that it is a little bit like filling a barrel with a hole at its bottom. Some of the biggest issues continuously increase in terms of, uh, of, of difficulty to being resolved. If I look at the forest or deforestation, for instance, look at the last 25 years, we deforested 125 million of hectares of forest rather than taking care of that aspect. We still continue uh, to exploit those forests in a very unresponsible way. If you, take about, if you think about indebtedness in general and the difficulty that uh, is being created for perhaps less developed country with regard to financing the changes that we're talking about, indebtedness has not been resolved and we still have to find solutions in this respect. So if you look at the, the, the world today, there is a paradox, very interesting and challenging paradox uh, on how to at the same time increase uh, the availability of those uh, innovative instruments in the capital market, but also have an influence on politicians, regulators, investors, asset owners, uh, on the way they do invest and develop uh, the economies. Uh, it is striking to think that um, the uh, first overshoot day moved from December to, uh, to August, actually the 1st of August uh, since 1987. I mean, we, 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 just, we just are, are we fooling ourselves or are we not responsible enough just to look at it seriously? This is a little bit what has been driving Lombardier's uh, activities in the field of sustainability. We believe capital is going to play a huge role, a huge role in making uh, countries, making societies, making investors understand uh, what is the seriousness of those problems. By simply making the capital a bit more expensive, you will, changes happen, you will see changes happen very, very quickly. Um, all those forces have transformative effects on our economies and companies as well have to find new ways to do their business if they want to continue to expand. Needless to say that companies are, uh, are sometimes preparing themselves, but not always uh, prepared and well positioned for a more sustainable world that uh, will probably uh, be a good solution and also uh, bring them uh, further um, possibilities to develop properly. But those companies still are confronted with our own financial markets asking for short-term results. And that's, again, a paradox in which the financial industry finds itself today. How to make sure that our analysts are not asking the companies to continue to do what they do well just because short-term they earn well, and at the same time to invest more in perhaps a less profitable short-term way to make sure that the longer uh, risk is going to be uh, mitigated. Well, but changes is coming. You know, I remember myself having been in 1997, and it was about this time of the year, I went to see a big uh, corporations in our country, in Switzerland, uh, very active worldwide on the food industry, and uh, telling them that capital was uh, starting to look seriously at how they were uh, developing their expertise in the world and not understanding exactly uh, how this will affect them. We just wanted to make them aware of that aspect. The meeting lasted 15 minutes. Ten years later, ten years later, this company won the uh, best uh, sustainability report of its industry. So things are moving very, very quickly, and I think in addition to uh, increase the cost of capital, if you want, we can also, by way of having an active stewardship, be an interesting, uh, uh, perhaps, agent for change for those companies. 
take uh, the example of the transport industry, for instance. Demographic changes will lead to higher mobility, as you know, migration, urbanization, all these are huge issues that have to be solved. At the same time, resources are, of course, getting scarcer, affecting the cost efficiency of current transport mode. And carbon emissions will increasingly need to be reduced, as we know, and avoid uh, and avoided to fight uh, uh, climate change, of course. As a result of these kind of changes in this industry and in other industries, what we have done in our own way uh, of looking at capital allocation, we have defined five or six mega trends through which we will try to analyze um, our global asset allocations and perhaps then the allocation through asset classes. These trends are the demof demography trend, uh, it is the national resources or the natural resources trend, the, cli the climate change trend, the inequality trend, and of course the digitalization trends. Of course, other norms or habits face the same challenges, including fu food system, for instance, as I spoke about before, education, healthcare, etc. It is very interesting to see that alongside the development of, uh, for instance, the, the green bond market and these kinds of instrumentations, a whole range of uh, ing financial engineering innovation was also made possible. We have last year with the International Red Cross Committee, uh, we have developed a uh, first, I think, of its kind, private humanitarian bond. It was designed to finance very specific needs in Africa uh, to produce uh, processes for victims of wars or displaced peoples. I mean, this instrument was uh, an interesting example of what we can still do today beyond what simply is our, our duty. We are now looking at uh, trying to do the same thing for resolving some of the big public health issues, uh, working with the, the Global Fund to try to think about how to bridge capital from the public and the private side to make sure that uh, things such as, or sickness such as uh, um, you know, um, tuberculosis, malaria, or VIH can be uh, sold more quickly and more efficiently through uh, better capital allocation as we know and can quantify the need that is uh, uh, the one of uh, solving these issues. The transparency and accountability that comes with more and more uh, readily available information is also uh, changing how consumer behave and what they buy. It is also changing the way people vote, as you know, and consequently the political agenda is changing. So basically, you know, to be responsible in this area as financial industry representative is simply uh, uh, being responsible and smart enough to recognize that our own environment is changing. And I think uh, if you look at sustainable investing, it is simply reasonably uh, good investing already today. We passed, of course, critical milestones, not notably in uh, 2015, when some uh, of the metrics were defined or some of the objectives. And I would like to insist one second on the fact that metrics, for whatever they are, are still very important to investors. They allow us to sort of converge our thinking process or make our thinking uh, process converge towards an objective that we want or we don't want to contribute to. And I think that is a, a way of opening the dialogue with uh, investors that is quite, quite uh, useful today and much easier today as it was uh, in the past. Uh, the Paris Agreement, the two degrees centigrade, for instance, increase in, in, in temperature, uh, will of course be a, a fantastic opening of a discussion to any investors today when it comes to how to invest in climate change issues. We already know that the current commitment made under the Paris Agreement will not be enough, but again, it is going in the right directions. The EU new action plan for financing sustainable development is also an example on how far and how fast regulatory changes is starting to happen. And of course, capital markets are not blind to this, as I said, and we are already seeing significant shift in how money is being put to use in the economy. Actually, it is not anymore what money to make, but how money is going to be made. Companies are responsible for making sure that they adapt s in a smooth and orderly manner, or they will, of course, be forced to disappear. And this will be essential if they want to continue to grow, but certainly, again, to attract capital. It also means providing more transparency and disclosure and to allow investors to make more informed decisions. Asset managers, to which we belong, have to adapt and also to innovate. We need to find better ways of working on how sustainable companies and countries really are and where they, uh, their strengths are to make sure that their weaknesses can be understood as well and risk can be mitigated. We also have a critical role to play in encouraging companies along the road in an orderly transition. As you all know, it is not a matter of taking a picture of where the world and the company and the ins investments could be today. It's a matter of understanding the film and the sequences through which uh, this change is happening. 
And finally, the asset owners are also, of course, very important players. Demand is perhaps the strongest force for changes. Actually, in our industry, you're never going to get good supply if you don't have the strongest and best demand. If asset owners ask the right questions of their managers and investors, advisors, uh, then the company, uh, their own, and direct more, they will direct more and of their own capital towards a sustainable business, and their voice will quickly build into a roar that is very difficult, if not impossible, for companies to, in, to, to ignore. Asset owners can do this by defining their no long-term beliefs, values, and objectives. And asset owners will want to be investing with more purposes. The question is, is investing for purposes enough, or should we look at it also further and try to see how to offer the right risk mitigation instrumentation to make sure that this is uh, well done? So increasingly, we see asset owners focusing not just on what uh, they want to, to do, but also how they want to do it. And this is a vital in ingredient for sustainability. We have indeed come a long way uh, in these uh, few decades. And our first step was using the exclusion, as it was mentioned before. We don't believe that exclusion is probably the right way. We prefer to uh, do it through a, a, a best-in-class type of process and make sure that we uh, try to encourage those who are taking the right efforts or those companies or, invest or investment opportunities that do show the right example rather than excluding them. Not only from a pure diversification point of view, but also by because it makes more sense. Those who have not yet will perhaps do it tomorrow. The next step is to look at sustainability through the lens of uh, risk mitigation. Considering the non-financial ESG criteria, I think this could be summarized as uh, simply as by saying, we are very keen in trying to understand what ESG allows us to understand better about the sustainability of the company. Actually, how do non-financial data help us make the better investment into the company? So when it comes to our own process, we're very much interested in ESG scoring suppliers, but we are even more interested in trying to make our own investment uh, teams understand each and every of the factors and try to reassess those factors by dialogues with the companies in which they want to invest, whether on the equity or on the fixed income side. Looking forward, given the scale and pace of the sustainability revolution, we believe it is going to be the biggest driver, as I said, of investment return. And we are therefore building and improving our process of identifying the business models that are best placed to benefit our economies and, and, and our society in general. We have, uh, of course, a long uh, history in our firm. We, we, we celebrate this year our 222nd anniversary. So we can also reflect a little bit on the past and how does a company in the financial sector uh, remain sustainable across cycles. We try to apply some of those ideas to the investment process transformation that is going on in our firm. And uh, when it comes to integrating sustainability into portfolios today, we uh, take actually a three pillar issue, a very simple three pillar issue. The first pillar is the sheer uh, financial analytics, i.e. we look at the financial robustness of a company as we all would do normally for an investment and just determine if uh, here the financial robustness of this company is sustainable or not. Second, we look at the sustainability of their business practice. Uh, how uh, well is the company run? In what context? Does it understand the challenges and does, does it take action? This is where the ESG criteria take, of course, an, an increasingly important uh, importance, but it's also where, uh, for instance, um, controversies may be very important. We at Lombardier, uh, we take um, two uh, elements as being uh, non-negotiable in terms con of controversies. First and foremost, the weapon, uh, and, and the non-conventional weapon industry, and second, the uh, based food agriculture product industry where we just simply do not invest. But the rest is much more complex and we have to be very keen in trying to improve here also our analytics. Data is really important factor in creating more important outcome. And the more non-financial data we are able to gather, the better it is. Not only because we are by definition going to make better decisions, because we are educating people who are proposing, advising, or making investment. But of course, sustainability is about so much more than just ESG. This is why we also look at the business model of the companies. How do uh, the companies in which we have assessed the first and the second pillar understand the changes in their own industry? How do they need to change? Can, for instance, the coal continue to compete in a world where the cost of renewable is rapidly decreasing? How will that affect the value of unboard fossil assets, for instance? What are the energy sources of the future? 
but of course there are many more questions much more beyond the, the climate change issue. But our job doesn't end when we buy an asset. That's what I was referring to when I said we have to discuss and also engage into discussions with the companies in which we want to invest in. We take our responsibility as a steward of our clients' assets, again on a fiduciary basis, extremely seriously. That means we don't necessarily want to have an opinion on everything that the company is putting for vote. We want to engage in di a dialogue with company on some of these qualitative aspects, but also in a way that makes them more transparent and makes them candidate for sustainable portfolios of the future. Mm -hmm. I was struck by uh, a lot of uh, issue, a lot of opportunities in our uh, uh, in our recent activities that led us to discuss with company we could not integrate into our portfolio simply because they didn't disclose enough on their non-financial information. And that's where I think also there's an interesting area uh, to be developed by the financial industry. That's what we at least want to contribute to. So again, when we put uh, all this uh, together, uh, the huge uh, challenges we face, um, the pressure to address them coming from all directions, the pace of the regulatory changes, the risk of all these creates uh, for our econ uh, economies and companies, and of course the huge opportunities uh, a transition of this scale brings to, then of course it becomes easier to see the sustainability revolution for what it is, again, a fantastic opportunity to make return in a better, more sustainable way for society as well as for investors. It will require us to fundamental, fundamentally rethink uh, the investment and investment processes, but you know, in, all, in all it will require us to rethink quasi everything we do. Climate bonds are a vital ingredient of this transition. The continued growth and expansion of this market is of critical importance uh, in providing investors with the tool they need to navigate the revolution, but also in providing asset managers a way to diversify, diversify portfolios into uh, direct and indirect impactful types of instruments. With uh, climate bonds, we can have this direct impact with uh, a correctly addressed investment philosophy in the equity side or private equity side, we can have it also from an indirect point of view. The question for us all then is, as the revolution unfolds, do we want to ignore it or do we want to invest in it? And we have answered that very clearly at Lombardia. Thank you very much for your attention.